I freed a thousand slaves. And I could have freed a thousand more if they only knew they were slaves. I would like to introduce you to Grace. Just so you know, Grace is not her real name, but her story is very real. Real for her and many men and women like her. Grace is an Ethiopian lady. She is married with a small daughter. A few years ago in Grace's village, there was an uprising. A local militia group came through, looting, raping, burning, and killing indiscriminately. Grace managed to hide and escape the onslaught. Her husband and her daughter were not so lucky. With no money, no home, and no family left, Grace decided to leave her village. She made ends meet by collecting plastic glasses and bottles from the street and swapping them for small amounts of money so that she could get food. While she was living on the streets, she was approached by a man who seemed to understand her situation. They began to build a friendship, and she began to trust him. He seemed to understand all that she had been through and offered Grace the opportunity to get away from it all, to start afresh, to get a new job, and to rid herself of some of the memories that this place held. Grace decided that things couldn't get any worse and decided to take this opportunity. She did not realize that the job was not in Ethiopia. She did not realize she would have to get on a plane for the first time ever, nor did she realize that she would be sold. She was isolated. She didn't speak the language. She had no idea where to go for help. Grace was trapped and had been enslaved. Fears of a second recession have caused panic in Europe's financial markets. The severity of this recession will cause more pain before it ends. The European Union cannot bail out Greece. You've seen the, the government of Spain coming out and saying, we have the same problem. Portugal says the same thing. There's some talk that Italy could be in trouble. U.S. intelligence officials are growing more and more concerned that foreign operatives are surveilling computer systems that control America's infrastructure. <laughs> Girls my daughter's age runs away from home or is lured by the false promise of a better life and then imprisoned in a brothel and tortured if she resists? That's slavery. Slavery is a powerful word. Civilizations, trade, wealth, even cities. Big cities were built through people. London, Wales, and many other places as history tells us how millions and millions of people fought for their freedom. Yet today we have 46 million people who are slaves. That's over half the population in the UK. Some know they're slaves, some don't. It is faster than the drug trade since people can be sold more than once. Statue of Liberty, Empire State Building, London's Eye. Many of these wonders of the world were built years ago. With all this new technology, innovation, yet many of these countries stopped building such huge projects? Why? What changed? Maybe new leaders? Or is it new laws? 
Many countries haven't tried building these enormous projects simply because they're expensive. Yet the Gulf countries like Saudi, Oman, United Arab Emirates, Qatar are enjoying an economic boom where they're turning deserts into paradise for tourists. In Dubai, an estimation of $2.5 billion was invested for construction projects alone in 2019. This huge success story was built with millions of migrant workers. Most come from Asian countries, primarily India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Most of these workers are promised better lives, well-paid jobs. But upon arrival, their passports are taken away by their employer. And then they start to work 15 hours a day, 6 days a week in temperatures which go over 50 degrees. And all of this just to get paid five to six dollars a day. No, the world has come to know what is happening. As a mother, as a leader, I will not stand, I will not sit and watch this kind of things. We are not animals. There is no slave trade anymore. This is Fun Madel, age 22. He was sent to Dubai from India, promised a better life for him and his family. We found out about him through his sister. He wanted to earn more to improve his life. The day Kumar left for Dubai was the last day his family ever saw him. A local agent recruited him. This person had contacts outside of the village and could arrange everything, so my brother was sent with him. He committed suicide in his labor camp. His parents leaked us a copy of his suicide letter. I do this of my own free will. This is no one's fault. The reason is money. My financial problems are too much for me. I cannot make the repayments on my loan. I have a pain in my stomach, but I have no money for a doctor. I ask that my parents and sisters do not weep for me. Please divide my possessions between the family. Marivik, give me lighter. I don't think there is a human rights in this world. No way. Maybe in Europe, but not in the Middle East. Millions like him go to the Gulf countries just to be slaves. We were contacted by one of the workers. My name is Shukama. I was sent here for work from India. I was told they would send me for building works and to a limited company where the salary would be 1,500 dirhams and four hours overtime. I have sold my shop and come here and they put me in construction work. For eating and cooking it is very difficult. Somehow, please take me to India. The drop is here to work and they themselves leave after that. I haven't been paid properly. When I arrived, I had 200 rupees, which I've used for buying necessities. I borrowed 150 rupees so I could eat. I have no money left. I want to go back to India. Somehow, I'm in a lot of pain. After seeing this, we decided to contact their agent, who promised us a sum of four thousand dollars a month and a good position as well in a well-known company. This is the same exact contract a lot of these workers are promised 
and the agent also mentions that the passport will be taken for two days upon arrival. This is the same lie told to all the workers just so they have no escape and they're prisoners. They're slaves. Because they're not getting any free time even. So peace and feelings. So people are a deep stress. Modern day slaves. Many of these workers are not educated, neither have the knowledge, nor know the reality of what they're truly signing up for. And they get trapped for years. आप खुद बात कर लो खत्म कहानी तो गरीब आदमी बेचारा मर जाएगा किसी की बेइज्जती ना हो आई थिंक व्हाट वी आर सीइंग इन एक्शन इज एग्जैक्टली द वे शफीक नॉर्मली वर्क्स इवन इफ वी वर्न्ट हियर फिल्मिंग दिस इज द काइंड ऑफ अम ट्रस्ट एंड कॉन्फिडेंस ही हैज गॉट टू ट्राई एंड बिल्ड अप अम इन ऑर्डर फॉर मेन लाइक दिस टू अलेज टू बी डूइंग what they're accused of doing this is a very very hard circle to penetrate and they won't want to speak explicitly on camera i was feeling confused even i was wishing i would die it was hard tona remember Slavery still exists today. Uh, it has uh, its own definition, modern day slavery. The United Nations defines it as such. Um, it's very subtle though. It's, it's very different to the stereotypical understanding of what uh, the concept of slavery is. Modern day slavery, um, a, a very good example would be where international employers recruit international uh, workers, get them to come to their countries, and then withhold certain valuable documents which limit the mobility of the employees. Uh, they therefore force the employees uh, uh, to work for them, they enforce contracts and the costs that are incorporated into those contracts and they leave the employees without any recourse to be able to get out of those contracts or to be mobile. Um, this is a form of slavery, uh, very, tact, uh, very tacit, very tactful um, and very done by unscrupulous uh, employers. Now, the consequence of this kind of, of modern day form of slavery is that certain mega projects can then take place because uh, the costings uh, and the enforcement of contracts allows the employers to exploit their employees, the workers that are now, the, who, who now have their documents withheld and who have the contracts that they've signed with the employers enforced strictly. In countries where you don't have this form of modern day slavery, such projects would be nearly impossible because of the costs associated therewith. Over 800 workers died in a year alone at construction sites in Dubai. The main issue is the kafala system. Ever since Qatar won the bid to host the 2022 World Cup Finals seven years ago, both FIFA and the tiny gas-rich Persian Gulf state has been mired in accusations of alleged corruption and more seriously, the poor treatment of migrant workers who are building the country's stadiums and infrastructure. One word in particular has entered into the public's lexicon, kafala. Kafala means sponsorship in Arabic and it's a system used in all Persian Gulf states, including the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, to control and manage their huge migrant populations who build these countries' infrastructure. Over 90% of Qatar's population are migrant workers, mainly from Pakistan, India and Bangladesh, but that percentage is similar in all Gulf states. 
they work for low wages, in high heat, and often live in sprawling labour camps away from the big cities. Essentially, kafala means that an employer is solely responsible for that worker's visa and well-being. The system is popular amongst the citizens of the Gulf as it keeps tight control over the population even as they are in the minority. But this system has resulted in widespread abuse across the Middle East, ranging from movement restrictions and non-payment of wages to appalling accommodation, from arrests, alleged torture and deportation for demanding better conditions, to suicide and even early sudden death from working long hours in unimaginable heat. Human rights organisations have for years decried this system. Human Rights Watch has called kafala a form of indentured servitude. Yet it was Qatar's winning World Cup bid, which it hoped would put the country on the map, that had a rather unintended effect. It also put kafala on the map and exposed a system that had affected millions of workers. But few know how kafala works. In many cases, the exploitation doesn't begin in the Middle East. It begins at home, as a long chain of governments, companies and individuals exploit some of the poorest people in the world. So, how does kafala work? Take Bangladesh, one of the largest exporters of workers. In fact, remittances, wages sent home from abroad, make up as much as 10% of the country's GDP. In villages far outside of sprawling cities like Dhaka, there are few opportunities for work outside of subsistence farming. Agents are sent out to the villages to find workers, often poor and illiterate, offering opportunities to make relative large sums of money in the Middle East. The agents have already secured their visas from Middle East countries, which have been raised and approved by companies and government departments back in the UAE, Saudi or Qatar. The visa comes at a price, money that they do not have, so they will borrow money against the family's land to pay the agent, the going rate for a Qatari visa being around £3,500 a huge sum in Bangladesh where the per capita income is just £1,000. Bribes would usually have to be paid all along the line in Bangladesh from getting a passport to sorting out the paperwork. Once they've arrived in the Middle East, a myriad of problems present themselves. One of the biggest is low pay, often far lower than the contract they had signed back home. Some workers can be paid as little as £200 per month, making it virtually impossible to send any money home. The worker is also trapped because if he or she returns home, they will have to repay the loan they took on their family's land. Without the money, the family is homeless, so the worker stays, unable to send much money home and unable to find a better solution. Kafala means that workers cannot change jobs without their employer's permission. In the case of Saudi Arabia and Qatar, they cannot even leave the country without their employer's say-so. So, millions of workers toil for a pittance in extreme heat. Even if they could afford it, they are exiled from living in the cities and herded into migrant labour camps with often awful sanitary conditions, living from 8 to 16 people in a room. Worse, your wages and conditions are often judged by your country of origin and how hard your embassy is willing to stand up for you. As remittances are so important to the Bangladeshi government, workers complain that they are paid the lowest wages and given the harshest treatment. Their embassy is unlikely to rock the boat. As Dr. Chowdhury Abar, director of the Refugee and Migratory Movements Research Unit at the University of Dhaka explains, the Bangladeshi government does not stand up for migrants with as much strength and support as they should. We are fearful as a country if we speak too much about rights and good treatment of migrant workers, we would lose the labour market. No one is even sure how many workers have died, or how they've died. Few statistics on worker deaths in the UAE, Qatar and Saudi exist. And it is in that context that the 2022 World Cup was being built. Initially, the plight of workers building stadiums and infrastructure in Qatar had received minimal coverage, but international reporting and persistent reports from human rights organisations brought the issue to a fore. Qatar made limited reforms on the system, but FIFA came under withering criticism for allowing the exploitation to take place in the first place. In a 2016 report from Amnesty International Secretary General Salil Shetty wrote that the abuse of migrant workers is a stain on the conscience of world football. For players and fans, a World Cup stadium is a place of dreams. For some of the workers who spoke to us, it can feel like a living nightmare. The bad publicity forced both FIFA and Qatar to start addressing the issue. A workers' charter was instituted, as was a system of electronic wages to end late and underpayments, but changes had been promised before and not been implemented, and at times it felt like true reform was being given lip service. 
and then the cause of the workers' rights in the Gulf got a boost from an unlikely source. A political and economic boycott between Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain and Egypt against Qatar has prompted a new wave of worker reforms. Qatar announced that kafala was effectively to be abolished, including the need to ask your employer for an exit visa. Contracts would have to be lodged with a central committee so that workers will get the same wages they were promised back home, and most significantly, a minimum wage would exist to end the practice of different wages for different countries, even for the same jobs, which had been criticised for being racist. This would mark a significant shift and would see far better protection for workers than the United Arab Emirates, which has largely ignored calls to bring in genuine reform. Although there would still be restrictions on workers, so it isn't quite the full repeal of kafala that had been promised. Still, both the International Trade Union Confederation and the recent World Report by Human Rights Watch, two organisations that have been sharply critical of Qatar, hailed the move as a positive step. Millions of workers continued to pour into the Middle East, escaping grinding poverty and hoping for a better life. But a word of caution. Promises have been made before. Often laws have been passed, but there has been little implementation on the ground, making any legal changes largely irrelevant. Human Rights Watch wrote that these measures would be path-breaking for Gulf countries where migrants make up most of the labour force, but the announcement gives little detail on how laws will be amended, how changes will be carried out, or the time frame for their implementation. As Nicholas McGeehan, a human rights advocate who has been one of the most visible champions for better worker rights across the Gulf, tweeted after the announcement was made, Human Rights Watch take an optimistic view of the human rights situation in Qatar in their world report. It's okay to be optimistic, and I hope they're right. I'm sceptical, and I hope I'm wrong. Okay. Slavery does not treat people as unique individuals, but as commodities things through which money can be made. You may be sitting there today and thinking, what can I do? You can spot the signs of slavery in your communities. Behind me on the screen now are eight general indicators that you could look out for. Through the stories I've told today, you will also understand where slavery may exist and where else it may interact with your community. The house on your street that has comings and goings at all times of night and day. The person that serves you but doesn't give you eye contact appears withdrawn. The service that you purchase but a third party comes and collects the money. All of these things may be indicators that slavery is occurring. I think often we hesitate, we're unsure, we don't want to get it wrong. But the Modern Slavery Helpline is there to assist you. If you have any concerns around slavery, if you think you have spotted any signs, call the Modern Slavery Helpline and they will be able to help you and advise you. If after today you want to take action, go onto the Modern Slavery Footprint website. This is a website that allows you to understand where your lifestyle choices connect with slavery. It gives you an estimate of how many slaves are working for you. I am ashamed to say that after all I know and after all I try to do, I have a staggering 38 slaves working for me. Once you are armed with this knowledge, you can start making personal choices about what it is you want to do to start tackling this issue in your own life. One day, Grace's exploiter left the door open. They left it unlocked and she decided to take her chance. The police delivered Grace to Unseen Safe House, where she was able to access the care and support she needed. She accessed the doctor, sexual health support, counselling, and legal advice. Grace is now living independently in the community. She is an amazing woman. She is learning English, and not only that, she is now volunteering to help other vulnerable women. If I never argue with them, still I will be their slave. We assisted them to get better accommodation and also safe and secure employment. I would like to leave you today with the words of William Wilberforce. You may choose to look the other way, but you can never again say that you did not know.
This documentary was meant to shine some light on the millions of immigrants who get false promises to make better judgments in the future. Do share and don't forget to subscribe.